Jabbar? Ujitra has done um, different kinds of research over the years. She started off with doing studies on food security amongst tribal communities. I think she went on to work on agrarian land relations in North India. She's worked on Dalit political leadership and um, the construction of categories in Cornerstone UN documents. But today she's going to talk about businessmen as philanthropists uh, from some of her doctoral work. I'm going to hand it over to Ujitra now. Good evening. I'm audible. Yes, OK. Um, thank you for being here on a Friday evening. Thank you, Natasha, for that introduction. I'm quite excited to share this work. It emerges from my doctoral work, which I defended earlier this year. And my PhD is an inquiry into the ways in which caste reproduces in the urban. So I focused on uh, marriage, gender, and desire amongst a business caste called the Agarwal. And, and so in this paper, what I want to do is simply try and answer three questions. What constitutes as philanthropy for these businessmen? Uh, who are these businessmen who are donating? And what role does this philanthropy play? Right? Now, to tell you briefly about my respondents, um, it was th this bunch of businessmen were the hardest to access. They belong to parts of Northwest Delhi. Uh, all of them have family businesses. They would be categorized as small and medium industrialists. And uh, they migrated to Delhi in the beginning of 1950s, as late as mid-1990s. They maintained strong mercantile roots, investing much of their agrarian surplus in the urban economy. So they moved to manufacturing, real estate, finance, telecom. And even during interviews, they were extremely tight-lipped about the nature of their research. But something that they were more forthcoming to talk about is the strength of their interpersonal ties, and interpersonal and intergenerational ties, as well as the capacity to raise money amongst themselves for any event that they required. Um, some of my respondents were dressed in a white shirt, white pants, white shoes, a gold kada. So it almost uh, evokes uh, what Christopher Bailey would tell you in late 18th century about the seat, the figure of the seat. Yeah? Now, um, having told you briefly about the kind of respondents that I was interacting with, um, let me give you a backdrop of what was happening in the 1970s and 80s. Now, as we all know, that 70s and 80s was a time of much uh, protests in the country. The Nehruvian model of development was crumbling around this time. And um, this was also a time when caste identities were getting a new lease of life through the associations, which had been dormant for some time. And the same story goes on for the Agarwals. So uh, in the 70s and 80s, you had the Akhila Bharti Agarwal Sammelan, the Dilli Parishat Agarwal Sammelan, and the International Vaishya Federation. These three organizations were formed. And uh, through the efforts that was undertaken by Banarsi Das Gupta, a former chief minister of Haryana. Now, the, Im Im the immediate task in front of these associations was to try and come up with an authentic narrative about who is an Agarwal, where do they come from, what is their originary story. And that's precisely what they did. They had to bring out a national stamp of Maharaja Agrasen. So they decided this was the time when they had to get their community intellectuals to pen down the history of the community. So the 1970s till 90s was a time when four things were happening. First, you had community intellectuals writing about Maharaja Agrasen, establishing him within divine origins of Mahabharat, and uh, saying that the Agarwals descended from Maharaja Agrasen. The second thing that they did was it shouldn't appear that all of this is a make-belief. and. Uh, uh, what they did is they undertook state-led excavations in Agroha and linked the kind of material that they did. There were three excavations that happened. And linked the material that they get, got to Agrisen. Uh, so Agrisen, Agroha, and Agarwal then became a narrative. Right? The third thing that they did was try and visibilize Agarwals through Maharaja Agrisen by naming things in the city space after him. So early 1990s, you had a Navy ship which was named after him. There is the National Highway. You had him inserted in the curriculum. Maharaja Agrasen Jayanti became a holiday. On Maharaja Agrasen Jayanti, you had people like Kejriwal in national newspapers. Almost half a page would be congratulating the community on it. So the Agarwals got a lot of uh, visibility through this figure of Maharaja Agrasen. The fourth thing that they went on to then do is to contemporize the idea around Maharaja Agrasen. And Agrasen then went on to become a political thinker. So in some ways, he was also delinked from his caste origin, and he became a national figure who could animate everybody's imagination. Right? And we know this. This has happened for other caste communities also. This is not an isolated um, narrative which is in place. Now, once the associations had done the um, identity building exercise, which was extremely important, 
um, the next layer of work uh, so this is still the 1990s we are saying. Now post 2000s the caste associations also undertake an extremely important role which Ramesh Berry calls um, the caste associations work as a space of enunciation which is that they also speak on behalf of the caste self. What does it mean to be an Agarwal man in contemporary India? Clearly you are not a Banya. The ideas of an uh, earlier Banya is somebody who is stingy and you know he exploits the peasants. That's the kind of earlier historical narratives we have also had, which has also uh, been seen in a lot of movies. So the contemporary Agarwal, the modern day urban identity of an Agarwal then became somebody who was patriotic, was selfless, um, was uh, Dan Purvak, like I already said, had the right uh, national pedigree because he came from Mahatma Gandhi, had the right divine blessings of Goddess Lakshmi. Right? Now once the associations do the job of identity making, the next role is undertaken by something what I call the Samaj. Now Samaj is both an ethic and an emic category. It's used both by my respondents as well as I infer it from the narratives. And uh, the Samaj is your inner core. So this, the role of the Samaj then is to extend the identity claims that have been made by the caste association and ensure that caste functions as a socio-political economic capital. right? So uh, the Samaj was constituted by the inner core of business elites, some of whom were my respondents in parts of South and Northwest Delhi. And um, uh, the, their primary task then was to ensure how do you make sure that an urban caste identity can also work as a resource for the benefit of the communities, mobility, resource, management, extension, all of that. Now that I've given you some kind of a backdrop, I'll um, try and speak a little bit about what constitutes as philanthropy. So if you look at, uh, there are two broad directions, one is the religious and the other is the secular. If you look at religious philanthropy, it can be broadly categorized into three things that were happening. One was the construction of temples, ashrams and dharamshalas, both in Delhi, outside and spaces like Vrindavan. So one of my respondents who heads the Sri Krishna Janmashtami Mahotsav Samiti, uh, built a temple, a dharamshala and an auditorium. While speaking to him about this recent construction that had happened, he proudly told me that the auditorium had seats as comfortable as the PVR and uh, the, uh, the ashram along with having a religious speaker speak, you also had a template or a pictorial depiction of all that was being said, much like the Akshardham temple where we do have literature by Sanjay Shrivastava on it. Um, and the dharamshala no longer looked like the age-old dharamshalas which were uncomfortable, you had to sleep on the floor, but they actually looked like five-star hotels. Right? So this was the first kind of constructions that were happening. The second is the organization of mass religious festivals like the Ram Leelas and Janmashtamis. Now uh, while speaking to the head of the Ram Leela Mahasang, this is a 1997 organization which was formed for the smooth organization of Ram Leelas in Delhi. Um, he was extremely excited to say that in the recent past, Ram Leelas had become extremely tech savvy. So when Ravan's head was decapitated, when Ravan was burnt and he f his head fell, the, uh, fell on the ground, his eyes would roll and it would say, hey Ram. Or when swords uh, were being clashing, there would be sparks flying in the background. Or uh, they stuffed the effigy of Ravan with about 10,000 firecrackers so that it would make an impact. Now Delhi Ram Leelas, the bigger ones, um, like the Dharm, uh, the, they're actually inaugurated by the Prime Minister. Right? So you get a sense of uh, how big these events are. These are not just your neighborhood small events. Uh, you also have small neighborhood Ram Leelas organized. Then there's the Janmashtamis that are organized. And the Punjabi Bagh Janmashtami is one of the biggest that happens in Delhi. Uh, in this, again, the person who was in charge of organizing it was extremely proud to tell me about how it's become tech savvy. And they had celebrities come in to perform. So he, in 2016, he had flown personally to invite Hema Malini to come and perform and amongst them they had raised crores of money. Um, some of them had gone on to even donate as close to 21 lakhs each for the organization of this. Now the third kind of religious uh, um, philanthropy is um, what is called Gau Seva. Now I found two things that was happening. One was uh, about thousand odd Agarwal businessmen from this area and other parts of Delhi but primarily Northwest Delhi uh, coming together to form something called the Kamdenu Mangal Parivar. Now the Kamdeli Mangal Parivar's foundation stone was laid in 2014 and their inauguration, the person who was supposed to come was uh, Lata Mangeshkar, just to give you a sense of the event that was being organized. She didn't turn up of course. 
um, oh, she could have. But uh, what happened uh, with the setting up of the uh, hospital, the idea behind it was, of course, the Delhi government has its gaushalas and there are veterinary hospitals. But uh, the idea here then was to have a state-of-the-art hospital with 24 um, uh, uh, staff which was there 24 hours. You also had ambulance facilities, ventilators and all of it. Now, the, uh, speaking to the person who started the Kamdenu Mangal Parivar, he was extremely passionate about Gau Seva. And for him, the interest began because his daughter-in-law finally could have a son when they started praying to uh, Gau Mata. Right? That's where the passion sort of originated. So there's one kind of construction of this kind that was happening. The other thing was that um, mem about uh, 120 odd uh, Agrawal businessmen got together and they had something called the Gau Grass Seva. Now the Gau Grass Seva is a trolley with four containers, steel containers, uh, with a bell and a picture of uh, Gau Mata, which would go across in different colonies. And the idea here was that uh, the first food, and this is my respondent speaking, the first roti of the house that has been made by the Grahani, uh, which according to one's dharmic duty had to be donated to the cow, would be then given here. And all of this would be packaged and sent to the Gau Shala. Now, the narrative or the way in which all of this was articulated, whether it was the organization of the Dharamshala, the religious festivals, or the Gau Seva, much of it was in a language of service. Right? It was about providing urban ease. And the Agarwal men as intermediaries, Agarwal businessmen, as intermediaries who would facilitate people's undertaking of religious duties. Right? That was the kind of uh, role that they saw themselves undertake. The second broad kind of philanthropy is what is classified as secular. Now this is the construction of schools, hospitals and um, universities. Now 19th century itself with the construction of Hindu college, Dalitram, Kirodi Mal, Deshbandhu, we know all of this was through Banya capital. Right? However, by the 70s and 80s they began to realize that nobody really knows the Agarwals made all of this. And also it was difficult for uh, uh, a single family to go ahead and uh, get so much money to build a college. So what they decided to do in the 70s and 80s is to think about registering themselves with the Societies Registration Act and uh, set up societies. So there were three big societies that were set up. i just tell you the details. So this is the Maharaja Agrisen Technical Education Society. This is registered in Delhi. Sri Agrisen North Excellence Welfare Society, again registered in Delhi. The, both these societies have about 300 to 500 businessmen. Uh, then there is the Maharaja Agrasin Scientific Education and Research Society. This is registered in Hisar and has businessmen both from Delhi as well as Kolkata and Mumbai. Right? Now, uh, with the first society, the mates, they went on to construct the Maharaja Agrasin Institute of Technology in 98, Maharaja Agrasin University in 94, Maharaja Agrasin Institute of Management Studies in 99. And with the second society registered in Delhi, they went on to construct a 500-seater hospital in Rohini. The construction is almost over now. And with the Hisar registered society, they have a medical university. Right? Now, both uh, all of these societies started off as small enterprises of the Samaj. It started off with 10 businessmen coming together and grew to have about more than 1,000 uh, for the bigger societies that were uh, registered. And uh, while speaking to the person who heads mates, which is the Maharaja Agrasen Technical Education Society, he is also a ex-BJP MLA from uh, Delhi, and he is also the Maharaja Agrasen Chair in the university. And uh, he was extremely comfortable telling me the ways in which they raised money. So he said some of this money, of course, is sourced through CSR. Um, some of this money, for example, we just had the Vivekananda statue and we inaugurated it, we got 11 lakh rupees. Every time one of our trustee visits, they would give us 4 lakh rupees. So it's not that we ever need to borrow. Much of the money, we raise it. Right? That's the kind of social mechanism that goes in sustaining these institutes. And also strengthening ties amongst these trustees, by extension. Right? Um, all right, now that we've spoken a little bit about uh, what constitutes as religious philanthropy as well as secular philanthropy, the question being why? Why is it that uh, for some of these businessmen, the cow continues to be an important figure? Why is it that ashrams and dharamshalas are getting a facelift and beginning to look like supermarkets and malls? Why is it that, um, you know, uh, why do businessmen continue to invest in the construction of hospitals and colleges? Or why are the budgets for Ram Leela festivals becoming bigger? Now, um, there are three things that emerge from the narratives. And the first thing is that it, participation in the Samaj helps to organize capital networks. It also helps in structuring internal hierarchies, 
ensuring how an individual would conduct himself within the market. So this is an extremely important um, sort of a social structure in place which decides how networks in the bazaar would also function. Right? Now, um, we have numerous studies. So we have studies by Barbara Harris White, um, by Sharachari who's looked at Gounders, Vijay Bhaskar has also looked at the Gounders. And some of the things that these studies are trying to tell us is the ways in which caste functions as a social structure for accumulation. Right? And that's kind of a similar narrative which also emerges from the fieldwork that I have done. So uh, one realizes that caste functions as an ideological backcloth on which modern institutions of business, labor unions, political associations can function following capitalist norms but being continually structured by homophilic ties. So ties of caste, family, uh, region, language become extremely important. Right? So um, some of the, also moving away from this kind of literature, uh, some of the international literature which looks at uh, socialization spaces of businessmen, for example, Iowa Ong's work, and she's looked at uh, businessmen in Hong Kong who, would, uh, f who felt extremely isolated in the US or choose to hang out in social groups, tennis matches. These were the other kind of spaces where they interacted. Now with the Agarwals, I found that uh, undertaking philanthropy through the Samaj was an extremely important side. So some of these events were ad ad attended by families and some of these events were all male centered. So some of these men would, once a year they would go for a all male cruise or a trip. But a lot of this was still focused on the institution of the family. It wasn't so much of individual consumption the way we see from the other kind of literature that we've come across. Yeah. Now becoming a part of the Samaj um, is extremely important because it gives you easy access to resources. So one of my respondents who moved to Delhi in 1990s, he had a successful business, business in Surat. However, he had a feud with his brother and um, he had to move with his young family to Delhi. So he had a name, the family had a name in the bazaar, but they he did not have much capital. So once he approached the Agarwal Samaj, they gave him money, he went on to build numerous uh, uh, real estate properties and eventually he sold some of it and he was able to clear off his debt. And this is a narrative which cuts across many of my respondents. The ease with which resources, tenders, things could be sourced because of their presence in the Samaj collectively. Now, um, the, becoming a part of the Samaj also helped to structure internal hierarchies, which means that as newer players enter the bazaar, and we're all speaking about family businesses here, yeah? Now, as newer players enter the bazaar, uh, it is also important uh, for the older players then to decide the merit of the partnership in the bazaar according to how much investment happened in the Samaj. So if in the Samaj um, somebody chose to invest and speak a lot about it, then this was something which was frowned upon. Because a big man, according to many of the narratives which emerged, was somebody who would definitely give a lot of money, but it would be all gupt done. So you had to have a frugal disposition not just to your lifestyle, but also to your approach to fame. And the other kind of a criteria in the Samaj that was used to judge you was how well you were capable of translating your values, your sanskar, a word used by my respondents, to the other generation. Right? That's also a preoccupying concern. Now, um, much of the way in which um, uh, internal hierarchies were structured through one's participation in the Samaj, it also worked out when it came to competition. So if you look at the bigger kind of societies which were registered in Hisar, uh, the two big groups that often have fights over who actually has a stake on this construction of the medical university is your uh, ZTV, Subhash Chandra Goenka, and your Jindal group. So also much of the feud in the businesses translated into the kind of clashes that they were having in the Samaj. The Samaj then, um, s sort of to bring this together, uh, Samaj through its structuring of the bazaar shows that businesses include a range of formal and informal socio-cultural political associations. Philanthropy helps to blur the structuring role of caste ties for business. As we know, markets are embedded in social structures and the Samaj then becomes one such social structure that does not allow the collapse of capitalism to markets alone, but produces variance to the logic of capitalism. Right? So that's the first kind of reason that emerges from my narratives for the reason why the existence of the Samaj and philanthropy. The second kind of reason for the participation in the Samaj uh, as I told you was to help modernize uh, religious expression hmm? and to make it relevant to the new liberal subject as well as to the metropolitan context. So as I mentioned, much of the anxiety was also about how do you ensure that your younger generation uh, would also be interested in the Samaj, 
would not find it old fashioned. And this is a concern which cuts across many of my respondents. So one way of, one social mechanism of keeping, ensuring that bachche na bhatak jayin, uh, as my respondent would say, is to uh, keep them uh, participating in the philanthropic activities that were happening in the Samaj. So for example, uh, in 2015, uh, about 80 of these young adults got together, they were asked to form their own committee, they all put in 11,000 rupees each and they were supposed to buy things for uh, uh, newly married girls from poor families. Right? So, and uh, in the process, they raised about 30 lakhs. And the senior members in the Samaj, of course, told me that there was no need for them to raise money. This is just a way, this is training wheels. This is how we teach them to be invested in the activities of the Samaj. The next thing of keeping uh, young adults interested in uh, carrying forward these intergenerational kind of ties and sort of tying together the affective with the business was uh, by keeping them interested in religion. So while speaking to many of these guys about what is the relevance of funding Ram Leela festivals, one of the narratives that emerged was that the message that Ram carries is extremely important. Uh, Ram carries a message about how do you keep everybody united when everything is falling apart. Right? So if I could just quote my respondent, he said, brothers are fighting, children are fighting. If we want to put an end to their conflict in family, increase their love between the father and the son, then we need to learn that through Ramayan, families can be joined. This makes our family, Samaj, Hindu Dharma and the country stronger. Now, however, to keep the young adults interested in religion, the forms of expression of religion also needed to change. They needed to be updated because now you're competing with other sites of consumption in Delhi. Right? You're also competing with smartphones. So how do you make uh, religion continue to be relevant for these young adults? Now, the younger generation, like I said, could also represent a section of new India, tech savvy, educated, impatient, um, perhaps not as invested in these kind of community affairs as their children, as their parents are, right? So the Agarwal uh, businessmen were very much aware that the manner in which they deliver earlier messages of sanskar, value, duty also had to change. Lifestyle choices of where you eat, who you meet, who you hang out with, how do you spend your time, all of this can't be left to individual discretion. Much of this is also a biopolitical project. So, and by fashioning it as a project, what you do in the end is that not only do you get an ideal younger generation, but your hope is that you would also get ideal Hindu citizens. Right? That's also the larger political project working here. Now, modern dharamshalas with their appealing ambience, luxurious settings, regulated food menus help embody Hindu nationalism. The relationship between the divine and the neoliberal subject is no longer just defined by intense piousness, sacrifice and abstinence, but is also through neoliberal Hindu nationalist consumerism. Now, this born homey between the market and religion, what you see, you realize that these sort of modern upgraded practices are not a counter to capitalism. They are not a refuge from capitalism but they are in conversation with it, right? they are actively co-produced. And uh, thus making this site, uh, these religious practices then become a site for meaning making, community building, entrepreneurship through competition. It responds both to internal pressures of keeping these young adults invested in the larger project and also the macro-political need to unite Hindus across caste by reinvesting in Hinduness without necessarily changing much about it. Right? But the third kind of reason for uh, continuing to be engaged with the Samaj and invest is so that uh, these businesses, businessmen could contrib contribute towards development and the common good. Right? And in all of this language of entrepreneurial uh, philanthropy, uh, what does not come across is the kind of economic and political structures which privilege uh, their possibility of participating. Right? So by constructing and running hospitals, schools, colleges, Agarwal businessmen pride themselves as never having to ask the government for anything, not even reservations. Instead, helping it achieve its development goals. By providing the basic resources like health and education through community endeavors, they act as intermediaries between the state and society. They not only address the concerns of the Hindu community through religious philanthropy, but they argue that they are working towards the common good of the nation. It allows the businessmen to decide what should constitute as development, for example, the cow hospital, uh, and the other things along with it, in correlation with state interests, it also allows them to transport caste and caste relations into something else. Right? So to sort of tie all of this together and conclude, um, what I've tried to argue today in this talk is that philanthropy undertaken through the Samaj helps to co-produce caste and religious culture, 
as a resource by organizing and ensuring the sustenance of capital networks intergenerationally. 